Please be seated. Could you do it? If Jesus told you to sell everything you owned, all your possessions, and give them to the poor to follow him, could you do it? Or like the rich man in today's gospel reading, would you sadly walk away because it was too much to ask? William Willimon, retired United Methodist Bishop and former Dean of the Duke Divinity School Chapel, points out that preaching this text as good news in an affluent church is hard because it is about money. It, it's about having, how having many possessions makes it so hard to follow Jesus especially in a world that so highly values wealth, position, and success. He's right, of course. This is evident in the ways that we try to explain it away, to soften Jesus' words. How many times do we hear people say, and to be honest, I've heard myself say, I just try to live the best life I can. I try to be kind to others and follow the Bible. That's all I can do. Far too often, that's an excuse, a way of staying comfortable by not looking beyond our immediate surroundings and those of our own families and communities. It's easy to just follow the checklist, the letter of the law, but in doing so, we miss the real point. When we stay too close to the rules, we limit our vision to only our particular way of understanding, and in doing so, risk hurting and excluding others. When we hold too tightly to our own values, our own identity, we take care of ourselves first. When we get too wrapped up in the endless loop of acquiring more stuff, more power, more success, we become careless about our earth and its people. Continued unchecked success and growth come to mean ignoring the negative effects that growth might have on our environment or on people in other parts of the world. And yet, this passage is one of the clearest statements of the gospel call of what it means to follow Jesus. And no matter how we understand the Bible, whether literally or contextually, it is shocking. For some, it is about money and wealth, giving it all away to the poor. Not some of it, not a tithe of 10%, but all of it. For others, Perhaps Jesus is not asking each one of us to throw our families and ourselves onto the welfare rolls, but calling us to examine our lives to see what attachments become obstacles between us and God and our neighbor. It may indeed be wealth. It may be the drive for success or prestige or power. Or it may be our attitudes, our values, our identity. Our story is, of course, about a rich man with many possessions who came to Jesus with an urgent question. What can I do to assure eternal life, to guarantee that I will be part of God's realm? He seems sincere, not challenging Jesus, not trying to trip him up as so many others had done. Oh, maybe he was a bit self-satisfied, proud of his wealth. Maybe he even believed that his wealth was a sign of God's favor, or was looking for a pat on the back for being faithful in following the law all of his life. But one thing was sure, he still was seeking something more. It was an ultimate question, something that the wealth did not satisfy, and so he came. He ran to Jesus. He took a knee in front of him, a posture not only respectful, but humble and reverent, maybe repentant. 
Perhaps he was expecting just a small thing to fill the void, one more thing to mark off the checklist. But instead, Jesus gave him a difficult, an impossible task. Sell everything you own, give it to the poor, and follow me. Not just one more thing to do, to do but a way to be. Things haven't changed so much in 2,000 years. We want it both ways, as did the rich man. We want what makes us comfortable, the things that are of the world and valued in our society. And we want to feel close to God and be assured of a place in God's realm. When we find out that it doesn't work that way, we too may walk away with sadness even if deep down we know that all of our stuff doesn't really satisfy, doesn't guarantee happiness or, or even safety. This doesn't affect only individuals, it affects our churches too. Our local churches, our denominations, our theological groupings and lab labels like progressive evangelical fundamentalists. At the local church level, we may cling more tightly to our local stories and traditions than to the foundational stories and traditions of our faith. We may indulge in nostalgia for a past that will not, that cannot come again. For circumstances change, and we must change with them in order that the gospel can speak in this time and this place. For our stories and history are not ends in themselves. They are a value for how they've made the church and its people what and who they are, but also as ingredients for an ever-evolving identity and direction that moves into new times and challenges while remaining faithful to the God who brought the church together in the first place, the God who urges us to put God first. I believe that ultimate questions like that of the rich man are still in people's minds and hearts. It really is a matter of stewardship. How is that? Jesus said to give everything to the poor, not to the church. Well, the possessions are not the only point. The larger point is reorienting our lives to follow Jesus, letting go of all that stands in the way, and how our money, time, and talents need to be rooted in faith and then pointed outward and used with intention, our values realigned with those of Jesus. How might this play out in our time right now as we come toward the end of an election cycle? a time of ever-heightening conflict and tension, how can our values rooted in faith push back against that conflict? There is the money, of course, the obscene amounts, billions of dollars being spent on candidates' campaigns in both parties. The election seems to be steered by billionaires. Then there are the distortions, the character assassinations that fill the airwaves, the snark on the ads, billboards, and social media, bearing false witness. I'm going to stick my neck out. Maybe I won't be invited back to preach again. We mainline Christians are so afraid of crossing the line toward including politics in the church or from the pulpit. I do agree that partisan politics do not belong. I find it harder to separate the political issues that impact our lives from how we follow Jesus' teachings. Example. We are now learning that Christians are stirring up a lot of the misinformation, disinformation, the distortions, and yes, the lies, in the name of Jesus. One of the powerhouses is known as the New 
Apostolic Reformation, the NAR. Presently encouraging and funding women's marches in Washington, D.C., holding four-day revivals, both promoting a Christian-led nation and schools, protesting LGBTQ issues, and making what sound very much like threats of violence and ballot tampering. And of course, placing people who are committed to their agenda in leadership positions nationally and locally in order to influence public policy. Where are our voices? Do we as Christians who pride ourselves on inclusion, on respecting the dignity of all, on loving God and neighbor, want to be painted with the brush of what is clearly not the way of following Jesus? Should not our voices be heard? Just this week, the Conference of Bishops of the Evangelical Lutheran Church in America, one of our full communion partners, issued a letter about truth and the moral obligation of Christians to speak truth. In part, they say this, we speak with one voice to condemn the hateful, deceptive, violent speech that has too readily found a place in our national discourse. We lament the ways this language has led to hate-fueled action. We refuse to accept the ongoing normalization of lies and deceit. We recommit ourselves to speaking the truth and pointing to the one who is truth. We find courage in our collegiality and implore the members of the Evangelical Lutheran Church in America, as well as our partners and friends, to join us. Then follow several specific points in their recommitment, all tied to scriptural reference. Things like pledging to refuse to perpetuate half-truths and lies, committing to fact-checking, courageously interrupting hate speech, and engaging with those who think differently. I often wonder what happened to the rich man. I hope he came back after he went away from Jesus grieving to carry on with his life, I hope that he continued to feel that something was missing, that he needed to return to God. I hope that he remembered how Jesus looked at him with love, even as he walked away. Jesus used the image of a camel trying to pass through the eye of a needle. It was hyperbole, but that's exactly what Jesus wanted, to show us how very impossible it is for us to love those worldly things and to follow him. And yet, there is good news here after all. Jesus looks at each of us and all of us as a congregation with love. Even when we hesitate, even when we can't quite let go. For as impossible as it is to do as Jesus asks, it is always possible with God. And that, my friends, is very good news indeed. Amen.